taking our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, second person of the Trinity, and placing them in little white envelopes, little packets on a fold-out card table, no ceremonial, no candles, no linen, nothing. Just placed out there like tickets at a carnival. You walk by and you pick it up. This is horrendous. It's sacrilegious. It's happening in the Archdiocese of Minneapolis. And we're going to cover how we got to such a low estate that we actually are seeing communion. Holy Eucharist. We really believe this is Jesus Christ. In a little packet, a little sacrament. Not the blessed sacrament that we worship in a monstrance, but a little sacrament. You pick it up, put it in your purse, put it in your coat pocket, walk out to your car and receive it. I'm going to run the video so that y'all can see what I'm talking about. This is the mini video. Let me get the big one on here. Let's see here. Just notice, look at this. Padre Pio, a priest, a saint, a stigmatic. When he's not serving Mass, he's on his knees receiving on the tongue. We're going to talk today also about uh, the importance of receiving kneeling and on the tongue in the Roman rite. I'm going to break through a lot of ignorance today because you've been taught that St. Cyril says that you should put your hands together like a throne and receive in the hand. And I'm going to show how that is bogus and false. And I'm going to give you some popes. I'm going to give you Thomas Aquinas. I'm going to give you St. Leo the Great. I'm going to give you St. Basil the Great, explaining why communion on the tongue is the normative, normal, and precise way to receive Holy Communion. Before we do all that, we're going to pray. So please join me. We'll pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us, the Lord's Prayer, the Pater Noster. Oremus. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster. Quies in celi, sanctificator nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, secut in cello et in terra, panum nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you would please give us the grace and the strength to protect and to guard the Holy Eucharist, the greatest gift that you have ever ever given to mankind. And we ask that you would please reform our church and give us popes, cardinals, bishops, priests who love the sacred heart of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a live show and, uh, Appreciate everyone showing up. We're going to go through um, quickly. We'll go through some good material today. And uh, if you like the show along the way, please click the thumbs up. And then to get more people here on our live show, you can click the share button. It's right beneath me on the video. Hit the share button, share it on Facebook. That'll bring your friends and your family over. And we'll have a big, strong turnout. All right, I'm going to share this horrendous, horrible video. Uh, this happened at Pox Christi. Catholic community. To me, that's a red flag. If the local place is called Good Shepherd Catholic Community, I'm nervous. That's not, that's, that to me, you're not a church, you're not a parish, you're a community center. I don't like that. I don't like it at all. All right, so I'm going to run this video of Pox Christi and uh, brace yourselves because. It's crazy. Here we go. Welcome to Pax Christi Catholic Community. No here. After the final blessing and dismissal, please remain in your spot this? and be seated when Father directs you to. To minimize points of contact, the ushers will dismiss you to receive Holy Communion at the rear of the worship space, starting from the back of the church in each section. You will be directed to leave through the closest exit. The consecrated communion hosts will be in individual packets on tables at the exit points. Take only one packet per person. There will be gluten-free host available as usual for those who need it. As you leave the worship space, please do not linger around. Proceed directly to your vehicle and maintain a safe social distance. 
of 6 to 10 feet, keeping your mask on until you are in your car. Once you're in your vehicle, you may consume the host. All right. There it is. Now, I, I, I want to go through this with you guys. Okay, so here is our... Welcome to Pax Christi Catholic Pax Community. Pax Christi Catholic Community. After the final blessing and dismissal, please remain in your spot and be seated when Father Mike directs you to. To minimize points of contact, the ushers will dismiss you to receive Holy Communion at the rear of the worship space, starting... So first of all, we got a worship space here. You know, we traditionally we call, we have a church and there's the sanctuary, that's where the altar is. And then we have the nave, that's where the people are, but this is the worship space. In the back of the church in each section. Now, you a very be- important detail happens right here in the video. We don't just want to teach you to pick up a little micro envelope with the Blessed Sacrament inside of it. We also want to teach you that you first walk by the collection basket and put some checks and cash money in there. Watch this. Directed to leave through the closest exit. There you go. The consecrated communion hosts will be in individual packets on tables at the exit points. Take only one packet per person. There will be gluten-free host available as usual. Okay, so take one packet per person. What if you are a um, a witch or a Satanist? You can take one, maybe you take two, but no one is watching you. This is a setup for sacrilege. This is a complete setup for sacrilege right here. Anyone could come and take one of these packets with a host in it and do whatever they want with it. They could put it in their their cup holder in their car and forget about it. Those who need it. As you leave the worship space, please do not linger around. Proceed direct. Look at, I mean, let me explain something here. In traditional Catholicism, when a priest brings the most blessed sacrament to the sick, this is pre-Vatican II, when things weren't insane. He wore a pyx around his neck that was made of gold. And the Eucharist was placed within the golden pyx. And as long as he wore the golden pyx, he could not talk or speak to anyone. An altar boy went before him holding a lit candle or a torch and ringing a bell. This told everyone in the town the priest has the most holy Eucharist on him. They would kneel in the street when he passed. They would keep quiet. The priest would then come to your home, and at your home, you, as a devout Catholic, already knew what to do. You would have a table set out with fresh, crisp linen on it, a crucifix, two candles, and holy water, and anything else the priest would need if if he's going to do last rites for extreme unction some bread. The bread was used to clean the hands of the priest. And then the bread would be disposed in the fire so that the oils wouldn't be desecrated. The priest would come into the house, bless the people. No one would say a word. They would genuflect. The priest would come in and directly go and give communion. There'd be the confidior and the communion rite. That's how it's done. Here, we don't have linen. We don't have candles. We don't have bells. We don't have torches. We don't have altar boys. We have little packets with the Blessed Sacrament in them. Now, I got to be frank. If a priest is doing this, does he really believe in the Eucharist, transubstantiation? I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd receive communion at this place. Does the priest have intention to transubstantiate bread and wine into the true body and blood of Jesus Christ? That's a question I have after watching this, because I don't see how a priest could permit this to happen. I'm going to run the show here a little bit more. Here we go. Play to your vehicle and maintain a safe social distance of 6 to 10 feet. Keeping- Consider all the details this guy's given you. Keep wearing your mask, keep 6 to 10 feet, etc. He is taking so many precautions regarding the virus, but no precautions are made for the Eucharist, for God himself mask on until you are in your car once you keep the mask on until you're in the car your vehicle you may consume the host open the packet and receive now let me ask you this 
what if a particle was left in the packet? And I guarantee there are particles left in that packet. It is Catholic teaching that every single particle and every single drop of the Eucharist is Jesus Christ, our Lord. What if there's a little particle in that packet? The lady receives communion with her hand. We're going to talk about that. And then what does she do with that packet? Think about this. In the Catholic Church, bishops bless and consecrate chalices and patents and altars and altar cloths. Why do bishops do that in tradition? They do it because it comes in contact with the Eucharist, with Jesus Christ. And here we have a little plastic paper envelopes. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? What happens to those envelopes? Go in the cup holder, fall on the floor of the car. Do you burn them afterwards? Do you bury them? Leave them in there, take them to the car wash. The car wash guy sucks it up in a vacuum cleaner. Sacrilege. There's no other word for it. This is sacrilege. This is not the Catholicism of St. Padre Pio. He's back here. See him right? He's in a little icon behind me. This is not the same religion. Padre Pio, Pio is a priest. He has holy hands. Look at him in the picture. He's on his kneel, knees receiving on the tongue because he believes this is true God, true man, Jesus Christ. Do we believe that this is God? Now, the, the difficult thing about this, my friends, is that traditionally, Catholics took every precaution to make sure there wasn't a sacrilege, that no one stole a host from the church, that no one received it incorrectly, that no one did anything that a particle would fall to the floor be left on someone's hand. Even the priest keeps his fingers, his two digits together after he touches the host at all times, just in case there's a tiny particle he doesn't see that might fall onto the floor where it would be stepped on by him or an altar boy or vacuumed up. These are the precautions. Think about our society right now. Everyone is at 130% on precautions for COVID. Social distancing. Two weeks quarantine if you're exposed. Six to ten feet, wear a mask all the time. Constantly use disinfectants everywhere and all the time. How come priests like this one, are not showing the same care for the Eucharist as they do a virus? Why is it that the God of the universe gets shortchanged when it comes to his dignity, the dignity of God? Think of Mary Magdalene, the precious ointment, all the money she spent just to anoint him. And Judas Iscariot said, hey, that, that money could have been used for the poor. But Christ commended her and said, wherever the gospels preached, she'll be remembered because she took great care of the body of Christ. She made it her number one priority. She came back on the third day to anoint his body even more on the first Easter Sunday. She had great care for the body of Christ. She went above and beyond in every single way. And Catholics in 2020, it's no longer the most blessed sacrament. It's a sacrament. I wonder, people who would go into a church and then just pick up a packet 
and put it in their purse or in their pocket or and walk out. If we gave them an exam on Catholicism, basic Trinity, incarnation, Mariology, seven sacraments, you know, just the real basic stuff that you read in the Baltimore Catechism. How would they score? Would they score better than an evangelical? Would they score better than a United Methodist or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran? This problem didn't happen overnight. It's been an erosion of faith and piety and devotion since the 1960s. Since everything changed, became new, updated, modernized. Let me give you a timeline of how all this went down. In around the year 115, so less than 100 years after the resurrection of Jesus, Pope Sixtus I said, the sacred vessels are not to be handled by other than those consecrated to the Lord. So less than 100 years after Christ, a Pope says, Unless you're ordained, you can't touch the vessels used in the Mass. Doesn't that presume that the lay people wouldn't even be able to touch the Eucharist itself? They can't touch the vessels that touch the Eucharist. And up until the 1960s, unless you were a subdeacon, deacon, priest, or bishop, you could not touch a chalice or a paten or a tabernacle. You had to wear gloves. Your skin could not touch a chalice, a paten, a tabernacle. Anything that touched the Eucharist, any vessel, you couldn't touch that as a layperson. That was Catholic piety and devotion, and it goes back to the 100s A.D. 1900 years ago, this is how we understood the Eucharist and piety. Here's another one. St. Basil the Great. He's an Eastern father. And he does say that people can receive communion in their hand under two conditions. I'm going to read it to you. This is St. Basil the Great. Just a little background. He's one of the Cappadocian fathers. Basil the Great was born around 330. So he was born during the Constantinian uh, freedom and liberation of the church. So you have the Diocletian persecutions around 303. Then Constantine has his vision of the cross in the sky. The Edict of Milan, 313. Council of Nicaea, 325. Right around this time, Basil's born. So he grows up in that first generation of Christians under legalized Christianity. He dies in 379. So he's right here on this pivot point. Here's what St. Basil says. If, notice it says if, quote, if one feels he should in times of persecution, in the absence of a priest or deacon, receive communion by his own hand, there should be no need to point out that this certainly shows no grave immoderation. I'm going to pause here. So he says, if a Christian feels he needs to receive communion and there's no First two conditions, persecution, and there's no priest or deacon around. All right, so you're, you're living covertly, in secret as a Christian. You have no access to a priest, no access to a deacon. In that case, it would not be grave immoderation. Grave immoderation is what Basil, Basil said. This presumes that if it's not a state of persecution and there is a priest or deacon around, it would be grave immoderation to receive by the hand. It's a conditional statement. Basil then goes on to, to clarify again. For long custom allows this in such cases. He's saying communion in the hand is an exception in such cases where you have persecution and no priest or deacon. 
So when you hear people say, well, in the early church, they always, they always did communion in the hand. We know that. The early church always, no, that's not true. Basil the Great said, in such cases, as in persecution and no priest or deacon, you can receive in the hand. I would never receive communion in the hand. I receive on the tongue out of reverence to God. The only time I would receive in the hand is, let's say this is happening. It's the reign of the Antichrist. It's the tribulation. It's the persecution. I have been arrested. I'm in jail. I'm going to be sentenced to death the next day. I'm going to die. And perhaps it's a layman. Perhaps it's a deacon. Maybe it's even a priest. They somehow sneak to my jail cell and they reach through the bars to hand me communion. And the only way I get it is if I reach out and receive and take communion in my hand. Then I would receive it because that falls under what St. Basil the Great is explaining. Time of persecution, absence of priest or deacon. It's an extreme situation. Basil the Great then says, in fact, all solitaries in the desert where there is no priest reserving communion in their dwellings, receive it from their own hands, end quote. So here Basil the Great gives another reason why you could have communion in the hand. You are a hermit living in the desert by yourself, and there are no priests for hundreds of miles around you, or dozens of miles. You received some communion from a priest, and it's kept out in the wilderness in your hut in a chapel. I don't know how, how exactly it would work back then. And on occasion, you would receive communion out of that tabernacle, out of that pyx. That's it. This is the early church. You can receive in the hand under persecution, no priest, no deacon, or if you're a hermit monk living out in the desert. Clearly, the people who are in the cities in a time of no persecution are not receiving in the hand. Here's another one. St. Leo the Great. He was Pope from 440 to 461. In his sermon on John chapter 6, we all know John chapter 6 is about, is the bread of life discourse. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, there is no life in you. John 6. He says in Latin, hoc enum ore sumitur quote fide creditur. That is translated, this indeed is received by means of the mouth of which we believe by means of faith, end quote. He's talking about the Eucharist. And here, the Latin word ore, mouth, is in the ablative, and it's an ablative of instrumentation. You're receiving it by means of the mouth. That's the mode of reception, the mouth. This is communion on the tongue already. Now, here's the breakdown, the timeline. The Council of Saragossa in 380 said that it excommunicated anyone who dared to, to continue receiving Holy Communion by the hand. So this was a situation. People probably, when they lived under persecution before Constantine, they probably, there weren't priests around, their priests might have been martyred, their deacon might have been killed. They might have had situations where they had to receive in these difficult means. And so there was kind of a memory of this is how we do it. But once you get into the 300s, the late 300s, you see the church, Basil the Great, the Council of Saragossa, saying, Saragossa says you're excommunicated if you receive communion by the hand. The Synod of Rouen in 650 condemned the reception of communion in the hand by the laity as an abuse. It said, quote, do not put the Eucharist in the hands of any layman or laywoman, but only in their mouths. The Sixth Ecumenical Council, Council of Constantinople, 680 to 681, forbade the faithful to take the sacred host in their hand, threatening transgressors with excommunication. The Roman Ordo of the ninth century says communion on the tongue is the normal practice. The Council of Trent in the 1500s said the fact that only the priest gives communion with his consecrated hands, is an apostolic tradition. It's an apostolic tradition, a tradition from the apostles that only the priest touches the host in normal circumstances. We're not talking about persecution. 
to the lay people. And even Paul VI, who's the one who unwound this whole thing, he said communion on the tongue must be retained. And of course, it wasn't. Beginning in the 60s and then in the 70s, this whole thing came out where everyone is receiving like this on the hand. Now, if you've looked into this before, you've been in a, in a discussion about it, you're probably saying right now, well, Taylor, tell us about uh, St. Cyril. Because I know St. Cyril of Jerusalem said to receive communion on the hand. Okay, well, here's what people cut and paste this quote, and they don't give you the full quote. Here is the full quote from St. Cyril. Approaching, therefore, do not come forward with the palms of the hands outstretched, nor with fingers apart, but making the left hand a throne for the right hand, since this hand is about to receive the king, making the palm hollow, receive the body of Christ, adding amen. Y'all probably all heard that quote. And they say, see, early church, communion in the hand. That's not the end of the quote. Listen to what he says next. Then, Carefully sanctifying the eyes by touching them with the holy body, partake of it, ensuring that you do not mislay any of it. For in that you mislay any, you would clearly suffer a loss, as it were, from one of your own limbs. Tell me, if anyone gave you gold dust, would you not take hold of it with every possible care, ensuring that you do not mislay any of it or sustain any loss? So you will not be much more cautious to ensure that not a crumb falls away from that which is more precious than gold or precious stones. Sounds good, right? Now, continue the quote. St. Cyril. Then, oh, I forgot to mention, notice how he says, take the body of Christ and then touch it to your eyes. Kind of weird. So if we're going to go by what St. Cyril taught here, that means you should receive in the hand and take the host and place it on both of your eyes. I don't think so. Listen to what he says next. And this quote could be fake. It might not actually be Cyril. I don't think it is. He says, Then, after you've partaken of the body of Christ, come forward only for the cup of the blood. Do not stretch out your hands, but bow low as if making an act of obeisance and a profound act of veneration. Say, Amen. And sanctify yourself by partaking of Christ's blood also. While the moisture is still on your lips, touch them with your hands and sanctify your eyes your forehead, and your other sensory organs. Finally, wait for the prayer and give thanks to God who has deemed you worthy of such mysteries, end quote. So if we're going to follow Cyril, if you're going to say, well, Cyril teaches communion in the hand. Well, let's see what Cyril really teaches. He says, receive the host in your hand, touch it to your eyeballs, then receive the precious blood. Then while your lips are still wet, take the precious blood, and touch your eyes, your forehead, and your other sensory organs, your ears, your nose, your lips. What? No, we don't do that. That is not Catholic piety. This is probably, I've, I've looked into it in Syrian churches and some Eastern places, this kind of thing did happen. It's an abuse. This is Eucharistic abuse. The church never approved of using the body and blood of Christ to touch your different parts of your face. It's meant to be eaten. Take, eat. This is my body. Drink. This is my blood. Not, not touch it on your face. That's not what we do. That's not good. So anyone, for the rest of your life, you are going to hear, and I get it in my comments all the time on YouTube. They say, Taylor, you shouldn't be teaching communion on the tongue because... St. Cyril said we can have it in the hand. No, you y'all have to go read the quote. It's from the Catechesis Mystagogica 5. That's where you find it if you want to read it for yourself. Now, what happened at Vatican II, what happened in the 60s, what happened with the Novus Ordo Missae is this. They said, we're going to restore the early liturgy. We're going to go back to how it was before it got all complicated and was in Latin and you know, you had all these rules and rubrics and it's all robotic and rigid. What we're going to do is we're going to go back to the early church. The early church was basically, they say, a bunch of hippies. They had a table in the middle of a room, wooden table from Ikea. And they had uh, 
you know, some jars or some clay cups that they made and a little plate. And they bake some bread in their oven, a big loaf of bread and some wine. And they sat around, they tore pieces off of it, and they remembered Jesus. And they shared their common experience, their faith journey. That's what early Christianity was. They wouldn't have had an altar against a wall, so they said. The altar would be out in the middle. Everybody around the altar in a circle, like a bunch of hippies in a drum circle. No. Go look at the ancient architecture of churches in Rome, Syria, Greece, the Holy Land. For the most part, they faced east. And for the most part, the altars are against the wall or situated so that the priest faces east with the people. The early Christians, Paul, Christ, they talk of the Eucharist as sacrificial. It's not a community party meal. This is a solemn event. This is the sacrifice of the eternal high priest, Jesus Christ. But what they told us was a lie. They said, well, we're going back and we're restoring how things used to be. And what they really meant was how we hippie people think Christianity looked in the 1960s, I mean, sorry, (laughs) in the early church, which happens to look how we think it should look in the 1960s and 70s. Ripped out the statues. You know, people are getting upset. Oh, they're tearing down the Junipero Serra statue. They want to tear down the St. Louis statue. Well, who tore down all the statues in the 60s, 70s, and 80s out of the Catholic Church? It was the bishops and the pastors and the lay committees. They were already ripping statues out of churches and no one said anything. Some people did. Most people just said, Father knows best. And I really like that statue of St. Joseph and the statue of the little flower, but it's gone now. It's in the basement somewhere. Sold it off to the Episcopalians down the street. So, what they did is they They tricked people. They said, we're going to go back to the early church, but it wasn't the early church. I'm doing this whole study right now on the Roman Rite. I'm going through every single prayer in the Latin Mass, and I'm going through the history of the Roman Rite from the time of Acts in Jerusalem, up through Antioch in Syria, Peter to Rome, and tracing what the Roman Rite was from the time Peter was in Rome all the way to the 1960s. And let me tell you something. Those early Christians in the second century, like St. Justin Martyr, those Christians before and after Constantine, those Christians in the 400s, like Leo the Great, up to Gregory the Great in in 600, to them, this was the most mysterious, awesome, mystery, sacrifice, oblation, the coming together of heaven and earth. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. The angel of God taking the sacrifice from the the lower earthly altar to the higher heavenly altar. They understood this as something profound. This was not a hippie community luncheon. To them, this was the eternal sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the redemption of sins. And it was highly liturgical, highly structured. So much so that you even get to the point where the Pope himself, they bring a curtain in around him, almost like an iconostasis, while he says the Roman canon. All these things are so sacred. You already heard me say that in the 100s, the lay people couldn't even touch the vessels that touched the Eucharist. You have to remember that the Catholic liturgy is inspired by the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, which is inspired by the Old Testament temple system of sacrifice. Very structured, very, as they might say today, rigid, rigid, lots of rubrics. They might even call it robotic, whatever that is. It's called being careful. If you saw someone working on a nuclear reactor, They also would be very careful 
and precise. How much more for God? How much more for the whole Eucharist? So, I want everyone out there to contact, let's see if I got him here, here he is, Archbishop Hebda. He's the Archbishop of Minneapolis. This happened under him. Packets, envelopes, snackerment happened there. Everyone needs to call his phone number, call the Archdiocese, write an email, write a letter. Let's bombard that office and say, this is a sacrilege. No more. This is not Catholic. It's another thing. We need to get to the point in 2020 where we can say that's not Catholic. There is a sense of the faithful. So, if you have it in you, be the Maccabee. Call Archbishop Hebda's office. Email. Write a letter. Let's take up space. Let him know. This is not... This is not the traditional Catholicism of Padre Pio. Padre Pio. Can you, um, what would Padre Pio say? You somehow bring him in a time machine to that parish, Pax Christi, and say, stand here in the lobby. Now watch what's going to happen. People walk out, put their money in the basket, and start picking up hosts in packets. What would Padre Pio do? He would flip out. What would Thomas Aquinas do? St. Bonaventure. Any of the saints. St. Gregory. What would the little flower, St. Therese, say when she saw people doing a drive-by and getting packets with the sacrament in it? It's inconceivable. It needs to be shut down. It needs to be stopped. These bishops need to be told because they can't do their job. They got all these priests who are off the rails doing this kind of stuff. So we lay people got to say, Archbishop Hebda, Your Excellency, with all respect, this needs to stop. It's not Catholic. And worst of all is it's an affront to the dignity and the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to pray now. We're going to pray in reparation to Our Lady of Sorrows. We're going to ask her at the foot of the cross to show our reparation, to show our sorrow for these horrible things happening to the body of Christ. And then we're also going to pray the Gloria Patri like we always do. And this is going to thank God that even though we're so sinful and such a wreck here on earth, he still dines to become the Eucharist for us. We do all this stupid stuff in the church and he still continues the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It's merciful. Oremos. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in molieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis peccatoribus, Nunc et ator mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicuterat in principio et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Saint Leo the Great, pray for us. Saint Gregory the Great, pray for us. Saint Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. Saint Pio, pray for us. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, everybody, thanks so much for watching. And like I said, if you enjoy it, please hit the like button. That'll tell YouTube that this is a good video and YouTube will share it around. Then please make sure you share this video. Hit the share button and share it on Facebook, please. That's the most important thing you can do to help uh, this show. And um, please subscribe if you're new. This is live. If you want to be notified, subscribe and hit the bell. You'll be notified every time I push live on YouTube. I'm also pushing live now on Twitter and also on Facebook. So if you want to get uh, notified on YouTube, please do subscribe. And thanks to everyone who's uh, supporting the channel via Patreon, um, signing up, signing books every week and sending out cool merch and autographed books of my own, including my book Infiltration. So if you'd like that, please support at patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. And then, as I always say, got to pray the rosary. We got to make reparation too. 
You know, I always talk about we gotta we gotta pray, we gotta stay close to Jesus, we have to ask Our Lady to help us, we need to read the Bible every day. One of the things that we need to revive in the church is the concept of, of reparation to the Sacred Heart. This is just us saying, wow, bad things are happening to your church, bad things are happening to your precious body. People are defiling and desecrating statues of Our Lady and the saints. And I just want to offer this discomfort, this penance, this sacrifice to you just to say I love you and I'm sorry that that's happening. It's like when someone close to you is hurt and you just do some act of kindness to try to make them feel more comfortable. To show I love you, I'm sorry. To show empathy and sympathy. That's the idea of reparation. So maybe one of the things we can do when we when we pray our, our rosary is you know we can offer all the Our Fathers in that rosary for reparation. Or we can add a, a special prayer to it and make reparation. And in this way, we become saints, we grow closer to Jesus, but we also, this is Catholic teaching, we stay the hand of wrath. If you look at the third secret of Fatima, there's wrath coming, and it's penance, penance, penance. Our Lady of Fatima reveals that preserves and obtains mercy for not only us, not only for the church, but for the whole world. So pray the rosary every day. If you don't pray the rosary, you're not on the team. We're in a battle, special teams. You need the weapon. Pray the rosary every single day and pray the Bible. Pray the Bible. Read the Bible every single day. 15 minutes a day will work wonders for you. Step it up. Read the Bible. I want to give you a, a suggestion. Last night after we prayed the rosary, I opened up my Dewey Rhymes Bible and I read the book of Jonah. Jonas. It's only, I think, four chapters long. It's a fun read. It's a quick read. Kids love it. And we had a great discussion after reading that. It'll take you probably less than 15 minutes to read the book of Jonas. But it's a great read. You know, Jonah and the well, you know, the great fish who swallows him. It's a great story about penance and preaching and uh, cooperating with God, resisting God. Great story, great way to introduce your kids to the Bible. And then after you finish, you've already read one whole book of the Bible as a family, and that'll give you momentum to keep reading the Bible, uh, either by yourself, with your friends, or in our case, as a family. So there it is. Pray the Bible. Pray the Bible. Why do I keep saying that? Pray the rosary. See, I always say pray the rosary. Pray the rosary, read the Bible, and you're off to a good start and do reparations. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ said you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless. Godspeed. Keep praying.